This is a video PowerPoint lecture from Chapter 2 of the Criminological Theory, Context, and Consequences textbook. So, like we've talked about up to this point, uh, the main purpose of this course and what the uh, book talks about is trying to explain uh, why people engage in criminal behavior. But, uh, as we've said before, this is not really easy because everybody has their own biases and perceptions and prejudices and ideas about why they think people do the things they do. And it's really hard for people sometimes to overcome you know, their own uh, biases in examining uh, facts and research results and trying to figure out exactly why things happen the way they do. The theories that we come up with in criminology uh, actually do influence policies that are implemented by legislatures, both at the local, state, and federal levels. So it's really important that our theories are based on sound fact, uh, because if they're not, you end up with policies that don't work out too well. And even if the theories are based in fact, sometimes the policies still don't work out that well. So, but it's important to make the best effort that we can. Uh, back in 1987, a guy named Bennett wrote a book called Crime Warps. Uh, I suggest you read it if you uh, have the opportunity. Um, but it was kind of his idea of you know what he thought crime might look like moving forward. You know from his you know 1987 time period. And the key point really that the book makes is that you can't really understand crime and criminal criminality without taking into account the social context of what's going on at the time. So in that way, it's kind of difficult to predict you know, what crime policy might look like 20 or 30 years from now, because we don't really know what the forces are that will shape uh, society at that point. Looking back at some of the earliest theories of crime, uh, usually it was thought that the cause of crime was located within individuals. Uh, you saw this in the initial, you know, spiritualist kind of ideas, uh, being, you know, possessed by demons or whatever. Uh, and then even in some of our, you know, theories that we use nowadays, and you know, some of the earlier theories that were developed in, in the positivist school, you know, still tended to locate the cause of crime within a, you know, a person, either as a, a character, character flaw. Uh, weakness of will, or, you know, those kinds of things. So as I mentioned, the spiritualism, you know, ideas from the earliest uh, times of theory development were, you know, kind of the, the devil made me do it kinds of explanations. Um, when prisons were first constructed, they were referred to as penitentiaries. I mean, that term is still used today, but you don't really hear it very often. Uh, but the the root of that word, you know, implies that a penitentiary would be a place where someone would sit and think about what they were do had done, uh, be penitent, uh, you know, this, the religious idea of repentance comes into play. Um, and so that was the original conception of what a penitentiary or prison, you know, would be. Uh, we've probably moved, you know, away from that to a large extent in today's uh, criminal justice system. But one of the main problems, and I think I pointed this out uh, in the last lecture, is that the main one of the main problems with these spiritualistic explanations is that you, you can't really test them or validate them. I mean, even if it were true that someone committed a crime because they were possessed by a demon, um, you know, how would you go about showing that? And you know, so there's really not any way to, to validate that empirically. So because we couldn't test spiritualistic theories, uh, they kind of had to move on from those explanations and move to things that we might be able to explain and, and test a little bit better. Uh, we moved to what were called naturalistic explanations. And these are explanations of crime that are based on some situation going on in the world around us. Uh, and so you know, by focusing on, you know, the, the physical world that surrounds a person, uh, it was much easier to uh, develop theories that you could uh, observe and test 
and you might be able to you know, find a couple of ideas that would influence uh, whether or not someone would engage in criminal behavior. The major school of thought that dominated the, uh, the early 1800s and late 1700s to an extent was what we call the classical school. And the dominant feature of the classical school was that it characterized people in general as being rational, rational beings uh, who made decisions on the basis of weighing costs and benefits. And it was this idea that people were guided by pain and pleasure, that you would do everything possible to avoid pain, and you would do everything possible to increase your pleasure. And so you people would engage in this risk-reward calculation, and they would engage in activities that would bring them pleasure and avoid activities that would bring them pain. And keep in mind, though, that just because the classical school says that people are rational, it doesn't necessarily mean that they always make good decisions. Rational just means that they engage in this calculation. Uh, now, they might calculate it wrong, uh, but they, uh, they do at least engage in the calculation. At least that, that's the assumption behind the classical school and its theories. This idea is where we got the idea of a punishment being suited to an offense, or what we call proportionality, uh, meaning that a punishment should be proportional to the crime, uh, you know, that we shouldn't over punish people, but we shouldn't under punish them as either. So it was this idea that we shouldn't be too severe or too lenient, but somehow we should match the, each punishment to the offense. And that kind of appeals to our common sense of, well, yeah, that makes sense, you know, that you punish people in accordance to what they do. Um, you know, whether or not that actually works is another issue, but this is where this idea comes from. And really, this idea persists in our legal system to this very day. I mean, this idea that the punishment has to fit the crime. And, you know, the, it's this, e you know, also this equal treatment before the law. This is another characteristic of the classical school that everybody was subject to the same laws, everybody gets treated the same, and everybody's subject to the same punishment for the same offense. Now, that doesn't always happen in practice in our system, but that is the theory that it's based on. Someone who was extremely influential in criminology and in the thinking that we use today uh, was a man named Cesare Beccaria. And he published uh, some work called On Crimes and Punishment. And initially it was published, published anonymously because uh, the ideas in it were somewhat radical for the times that he lived in. And he was afraid of uh, what the monarchy in uh, the country he lived in might think. And um, so again, the, the social context of his times played a large role in his thinking. And if you go back to you know the late 1700s, early 1800s in Europe, uh, the criminal justice systems of that time period really were designed to just completely destroy people if they were convicted of a crime. Uh, if you were arrested, um, you know you were almost certain to be found guilty because there were very few legal protections in that time. And once you were found guilty, the punishments were very severe, with death being very common for even somewhat minor offenses, uh, at least what we would consider minor today. Uh, and so he saw the criminal justice system of his time as being kind of overly brutal and thought that it needed some reform. And so he published his ideas on what those reforms, uh, what he thought they should look like. His arguments are summarized in uh, this list of tenets that we're going to go through in the next few slides. And we'll go through them a little bit quickly here, but make sure you read them in the book and understand them because they are very important. So number one there really is kind of the assumption behind everything he's talking about. Uh, it's assumed that people in society have agreed to give up some portion of their freedom. Uh, so that we can establish laws and agree to be subject to them and give power to the government to enforce them and punish people who break them. Uh, but he also said that criminal laws, uh, because they restrict our freedoms in an otherwise free society, they should be pretty limited in, in scope. I mean, he saw criminal laws as really just dealing with a few key areas that uh, dealt with, you know, people's infringements of other ones, other people's rights 
and uh, you know, it's probably expanded today much beyond what he would have envisioned. Uh, but he saw the criminal law as being kind of restricted in what it could actually cover. Uh, and then the you know this number three you might recognize this idea from our system today. Uh, he said that the presumption of innocence prior to being found guilty should be the guiding principle in administering justice. So, you know, that's an idea that's persisted in our system even to this day. Uh, and whether it actually, you know, is carried out in practice can be argued, but it, it is an idea that we still hold to in our system and, you know, it has its roots back in the thinking of some of these early scholars. So continuing Beccaria's argument, he argued that the criminal code should be written down uh, in advance and that all offenses and punishments should be defined in advance. Uh, this allowed everybody the opportunity to know what the criminal laws were, what they should and shouldn't do, and it prevented the government from making things up as they went along. Uh, number five is that punishment should be based on a retributive philosophy uh, and again this goes to why we Im implement punishments. There are a lot of reasons we can use to justify punishing offenders uh, but he argued that retributive reasoning was the best reason and all that really means is we punish people because they deserve it because they have infringed on someone else's rights and that's basically it. Uh, we don't worry about whether or not they're going to be rehabilitated or reformed. Uh, we just worry about the fact that they deserved it and so we punish them. He also argued that severity of punishment uh, should be limited and not go beyond what is necessary uh, to prevent that person from committing that crime in the future. So this again is tied to the times he lived in where punishments tended to be very severe and he said really severity should match you know, whatever the seriousness of the crime was. We see the continuation of that thinking in number seven in his argument that criminal punishment should correspond to the seriousness of the crime. And this is an idea that we still use in our system today, that the punishment should fit the crime. And we like that because it appeals to our common sense uh, that, you know, Serious crimes get a more serious punishment, minor crimes get a minor punishment, and you know, it kind of makes sense in our head. Um, number eight says punishment should be certain and it should be inflicted quickly. Uh, Beccaria said that if punishment was uncertain, uh, and it, even if it was inflicted, if it was delayed, uh, that you kind of lose the effect uh, you know, of the punishment at that point. And he said that in number nine there, we should not be concerned with reforming somebody or making an example of them to the public. Uh, again, this just goes back to his idea of the retributive uh, philosophy of punishment, uh, but essentially just saying we should not concern ourselves with those kinds of outcomes. So looking at the last couple of points of Beccaria's tenets here, uh, the offender should be viewed as an independent and reasonable person who weighed the consequences of the crime. So that's just going back to that view of, of people as rational and you know, cost calculating. And the aim of legislation should be the prevention of crime. So those are the last couple of points he had there. A couple of other scholars who were influential uh, who lived at a, around the same time as Beccaria uh, are noted here. Uh, one is Jeremy Bentham. He also saw punishment as being a, uh, a deterrent. Uh, some of his ideas are where uh, deterrence theory uh, comes from. And uh, he saw behavior as the result of free will and the hedonistic calculus, which is just that weighing of costs and benefits or pleasure and pain and uh, you know, going forward on, on that basis. John Howard was another uh, thinker of the day who was credited with the passage of the Penitentiary Act of 1779. This is where we really saw the creation of the first real penitentiaries. Uh, and, you know, he was uh, one of the scholars who was influential in that area. As with any uh, school of thought, uh, of course there are many good ideas in the classical school that you may find appealing, but there are also some weaknesses in some of the ideas that are expressed there, and these weaknesses have become maybe more apparent as we've done more research and examined these ideas. 
but this explanation of crime and criminal behavior uh, by a simple weighing of cost and benefits really is too simplistic. That's one of the key uh, weaknesses of this line of thought is that you know there are just there's a lot there are a lot more things going on in a person's situation rather than just a simple weighing of cost and benefits. Uh, and when you look at the behavior of you know younger children and juveniles, a lot of times they do things that they don't even know why they do them, um, and they're not based on any kind of a calculation. And they also have a different psychological makeup. They're not develop, developed as much as adults are mentally. And so there was no separate treatment for of children um, under this original line of thought. Because uh, they just kind of treated everybody the same. It was just this rational being that calculated uh, costs and benefits. So this kind of simplistic view that was offered by the early classical school theorists uh, really just has not held up that well in terms of explaining uh, criminal behavior fully. Coming in on the tails of the classical movement is what we call the positivist school of criminology. And you know this term positivist, what it refers to is what we ref what we call the positive application of the scientific method. And so the positivist school was really the first kind of group of people to uh, to look at crime as a scientific problem and something that could be subjected to scientific inquiry. And so that that's uh, again the positivist school, you know, looked at the idea that there are multiple things influencing this, and they the positivist theorists saw crime or as kind of being determined by a person's circumstances and environment. Uh, you know, really the classical school focused a lot more on the system and how it dealt with criminals. Uh, the positivist school is really the first. Uh, you know, a, attempt to really explain why people do what they do and why they commit crimes. So in the 19th century, um, you know, they, they started looking at features of criminals and especially looking at physical characteristics and uh, psychological or, or mental capacity. And, you know, early on, they didn't really look to uh, social factors that were outside of people. They still, in the earliest days, were stuck on the idea that, that crime would be, the cause of crime would be located within the person. And so they started their scientific inquiry by examining the characteristics of criminals. The person who is usually credited with being the father of modern criminology is this guy named Cesare Lombroso. And you know, he was the one who carried out some of the first well-documented experiments to determine if there were differences between criminals and non-criminals in terms of their physical and psychological makeup. The very first experiments that Lombroso did uh, really were based in uh, biology. And he argued that mental and physical deficiencies uh, were the cause of people becoming crimes. And he really, he did um, a lot of research using soldiers, uh, you know, to document physical differences between uh, crime or criminals and non-criminals and back then he even looked at the role of tattooing as being a dis distinguishing characteristic of criminals and you know maybe some of that um, you know that even carries through into some people's thinking today although we certainly wouldn't argue today that you know anyone who has a tattoo is a criminal because that's just isn't, it just isn't true Just like uh, Beccaria, Lombroso also started to publish his findings on his biological research for explaining criminal behavior. And his uh, publication was called On Criminal Man. Um, and he really, again, he had this biological focus and evolutionary focus, again, kind of keeping in with the ideas of his day. Uh, 
Uh, you know, those, those were the scientific ideas that were prominent uh, at that time. Lombroso argued that criminals had a peculiar physical type that was different from that of non-criminals. And essentially what he argued was that criminals were kind of a, they were evolutionary throwbacks, that they just hadn't evolved sufficiently uh, to, you know, become, you know, good citizens. And so he, he looked at, you know, some physical characteristics that were, you know, that maybe back then they would consider kind of more caveman-like, uh, you, know, you know, again, tying into this idea of evolution. Um, he looked at people, you know, the size of their ears, the long sloping forehead, people who had extra long arms, and those kinds of things. And he argued that, you know, people with these physical characteristics were more likely to be criminals because they were just not as evolved as the rest of us. And he actually did experiments and studies on this to see if his theory panned out. Lombroso categorized criminals uh, into four categories. Uh, one is just what he called born criminals. These are people, uh, again, these atavistic characteristics. Those are the characteristics of the evolutionary throwbacks. Uh, you know, he said if you were born that way, it was just evident that you were going to be a criminal pretty much from day one. Um, insane criminals were people he classified as idiots, imbeciles, paranoiacs, epileptics, and alcoholics. So he attributed these people's uh, criminal behavior mostly to their lack of mental capacity. Um, and, and again, looking at you know, even intelligence and those sort of things. And then there's what he called the occasional criminal, uh, which were just criminals of opportunity. You know, just hey, there's an opportunity to do something, I can get away with it, so I'll do it. So these are people that he, you know, that he said didn't really seek out a criminal lifestyle, but if the opportunity presented itself and it was easy, then they would do it. And then there's what he called criminals of passion. And these are, you know, crimes committed out of, you know, some strong emotional uh, provocation. Uh, so you can imagine some of the examples there. Lombroso really did give attention to a multiple factor explanation of crime. Uh, he didn't focus on any one thing. Uh, the classical school really just focused on this idea of pain versus pleasure and that was it. Uh, but he included you know, heredity, social factors, cultural influences, and also economic variables. And Lombroso really is credited, I mean, even though some of, you know, most of his ideas didn't really pan out and they sound kind of silly to us today, uh, he really is credited with pushing the study of crime away from kind of abstract kinds of things that are difficult to understand and bringing it down into the scientific realm in a way that you can measure things and, and test them and, you know, theorize and see if you can figure some things out. So he took the topic of the causes of crime away from you know, this idea of sin and you know, the spiritualist kind of thing and really you know, brought it into the realm of scientific inquiry. So looking at the work of the Italian positivists like uh, Lombroso, you know, there were methodological problems with some of their research, but you know, they did the best they could. Um, but, you know, again, it was kind of a science that was in its infancy. So it's easy to look back now and, you know, kind of see maybe some of the things that were problematic with the way their research was conducted. Um, but someone who kind of followed up on some of these issues was a man named Goring. And he tried to resolve some of the problems with the early researchers. Uh, by using a control group of uh, non-convicts uh, and, you know, comparing them to convicts. And so when he did some of the same kinds of experiments that Lombroso did, only using, you know, a control group as a comparison, which is a more uh, methodologically rigorous way to do your research, what he found was that there really were no differences between criminals and non-criminals. Um, except for, you know, their stature and body weight, 
we found that criminals were actually slightly smaller than non-criminals. Um, he claimed that criminals were biologically inferior, um, but he didn't really go much beyond that and in trying to define any like physical body types or anything. So, you know, he did find a few things that were interesting, but it's very difficult to really draw a lot of conclusions from this. Uh, because you can't just say, okay, well, everybody who's small is a criminal. I mean, because that's clearly not the case either. But, you know, he did find some of these differences, and it, it at least gives us an avenue to think, well, maybe there's something more that we should look at here. Uh, a guy named Kretschmer, uh, he actually did try to uh, delineate some criminal body types. And I'm not going to go through these in detail. You can look at these in the book. Um, but you know, he did try to, you know, he delineated these body types here, and uh, you know, associated you know some of these people with with different types of crimes. But the more well known uh, criminologist who developed these body type classifications was a guy named Sheldon. Uh, but again, here's just looking at these uh, other researchers who looked at body types. Uh, they did actually find that, you know, based on Gorham's body types, that there were certain ones that were more likely to be convicted of certain types of offenses. Ernest Hooten was a Harvard anthropologist, and he did similar kinds of experiments. Um, you know, he examined over 17,000 uh, criminals and non-criminals. And, and again, he said that they were inferior to civilians in nearly all of their bodily measurements, although, you know, I mean, it's, it's difficult to really say what that means. Um, but what Hooten talked about was, again, some of these same kinds of, uh, you know, what he, they saw as evolutionary uh, characteristics that were not as advanced as other people. And again, keep in mind that a lot of these, this thinking probably has to do with some of the social context of the time, um, with uh, you know what was going on with race relations and things like that in our country, in, in the world at that point. Um, but again, a lot of these ideas didn't really hold up to scrutiny over long periods of time. I mean, these guys, you know, kind of claimed they found some things. Um, but, you know, over time, these ideas have not really held up all that well. The name you see associated with body types uh, most often is William Sheldon. And he kind of shifted his attention away from looking at adults to focusing on uh, juveniles or youths. And he uh, did a study involving a couple of hundred males between the ages of 15 and 21. And he developed kind of an index that was used to, develop, uh, to rate someone's delinquency and you know, measure the severity of their problems. Sheldon's body types uh, fall into three categories. There's what he called the endomorph, the mesomorph, and the ectomorph. And so you can see the definitions there. Uh, endomorphs are kind of soft and fat. Mesomorphs are muscular and athletic. And ectomorphs are skinny. And he kind of concluded from some of his experience uh, or experiments that certain body types, you know, and again, these are similar to the ones we saw before, but certain body types were more likely to be associated with certain types of criminal behavior. Another large study of youth was done by Sheldon and Eleanor Gluck. And these were, um, they were professors at Harvard University, and, you know, their study really is one of the largest studies that's ever been done. Uh, they, you know, followed uh, a large sample of delinquent males for a very long period of time and gathered a lot of data over a very long time period. And, um, and they also did some, you know, studying of physical characteristics and they did find uh, you know again some of these um, ideas but 
what you have to realize is that a lot of these findings from these researchers where they did find some associations with different body types, one of the reasons that you can get these findings is because they were not accounting for other things in people's lives that mattered, like the sociological phenomena going around someone in their life. So if you don't account for those things, um, you can find relationships that appear to be real when in fact they're not, um, because you haven't accounted for everything that you need to. There's another school of thought in criminology called the psychogenic school, um, which really focuses on uh, looking at the personality and how it was produced. And these, this line of thinking developed really along two lines. Uh, one is psychoanalysis, uh, the other is personality traits. Psychoanalysis is mostly the realm of psychology. Uh, people like Sigmund Freud and you know, people like that who have uh, developed those kinds of ideas. Uh, psychology also does quite a bit of work with personality traits. But that's also an area that you know criminologists have devoted themselves to a little bit uh, in determining what you know character traits make someone more likely to be a criminal versus not. So, like I said, psychoanalysis is mostly based on Sigmund Freud's work. And again, this isn't a psychology class, so we're not going to get too deep into this. But essentially, what they said, or what he said is that you have this unconscious part of your mind, which he called the id, uh, which is kind of a reservoir of all of your, you know, aggressive and, you know, psychological urges that you have. The conscious mind, the ego, uh, is what controls and, and molds the individual, and it kind of, you know, has to control the id. Uh, so the superego, Freud said, is the, this force of self-criticism uh, that reflects the basic behavior requirements of a particular culture. So this is kind of how behavior is governed. So again, not going to get too deep into these ideas, but that was the line of thinking that, that Sigmund Freud had. And you know, he didn't necessarily talk a lot about crime, uh, but this was kind of a, uh, a general attempt to explain, uh, to just explain human behavior in general. In the uh, psychoanalysis school, crime is seen as kind of an expression of inner tensions that you have failed to control. Uh, and, you know, Freud would have said that crime results when the ego and or the superego, you know, fail to develop. Um, or you may just develop a, a delinquent ego, which, you know, again, just makes you a more persistent criminal. Moving to personality traits, uh, you know, this is something that a lot of researchers have looked at, uh, you know, trying to figure out which personality traits might explain criminal behavior the best. Um, one that, that some researchers latched on to was what they called feeble-mindedness. And really all that means is really kind of low intelligence. You know, some of the early efforts to measure IQ and that sort of thing, uh, if your intelligence rated too low, uh, then you were labeled as being feeble-minded. And that it was argued that people that fell in that category would be more likely to be criminals. Alfred Binet was the first one to really pursue intelligence testing under you know, scientifically rigorous conditions. And he kind of, he's the one that developed, uh, well, with Theodore Simon, this, these, this idea of IQ, and that we could measure someone's intelligence with this IQ score. And what, would, what was found is that you know, when they administered these tests to inmates, uh, that most uh, people in prison, you know, fell in this range that they called, uh, you know, feeble-minded. And so this was, uh, you know, one explanation of crime that was offered that, well, people are criminals just because they're not very smart, they're not intelligent. Um, and again, this, again, might be too simplistic, but that was one idea that was advanced uh, at one time. 
looking back at the positivist school, uh, the, again, I, who I mentioned earlier, the early positivists really relied on placing the causes of crime within individual offenders. Uh, they really didn't look too much outside of that, and you, know, you can see that in Lombroso's early work, where he was looking at physical characteristics of the offender, uh, psychological characteristics of the offender, and these other researchers who looked at intelligence, you know, again, placing the cause of crime within uh, the offender. And again, these people, when they were doing this research, there really was no such thing as criminology back then. Uh, you know, most of these people were doctors or lawyers uh, or both. They were scientists, uh, but there really was no science called criminology. They just were studying crime, uh, you know, as it related to their training. So looking at some of the policies that flowed from the work of these early positivists, uh, you know, again, looking at this idea of the born criminal, uh, you know, I mean, there were a lot of people that believed that this was legitimate, that you know, there are some people that just were born with characteristics or traits that would cause them to commit crime. And so this idea that some people were born criminals uh, really created a, uh, a punishment philosophy that stressed incapacitation. And when we, were, when we say incapacitation, this is another one of these philosophies of punishment, um, all we're saying is we're just going to remove you from the community. We're just going to prevent you from committing more crimes by putting you somewhere, uh, which, you know, usually was prison. So, again, it's not really based on the idea of deserving the punishment. It's not based on rehabilitating them. It's just simply removing someone from the community so that they don't cause any more harm. And you know, the idea was if someone was a born criminal, uh, you know, reforming them was probably hopeless. Um, whether or not they deserved it really was kind of irrelevant, uh, but we're just going to remove them from the community so that they don't cause any more uh, problems. Um, rehabilitation was based on um, you know, what we call a medical view uh, or a medical model, you'll see you sometimes, uh, basically arguing that crime is an illness, you know, and you need, you need treatment. And it actually created, you know, rehabilitation sounds great. Um, you think, oh, we're going to help people and make them better people. But it actually, you know, has spawned some policies that are pretty oppressive. Um, because if you think about it, uh, if someone is you know, classified as being sick, well, then you don't let them out of prison until they're cured. Um, and so who gets to say when they're cured and how long is that going to take? And you may end up keeping people locked up for time periods far longer uh, than they normally would be uh, because they haven't, you know, reached this state of being, you know, cured of their illness. Another problem that has arisen out of all this is what we call the eugenics movement. Um, this really argued that genetics could explain most human behavior, including crime. So if you were a criminal, the idea is that, well, that's an inherited trait. Now, we know today that there really is no such thing as you know, inherited criminality. I mean, you can inherit traits from your parents that might make you more likely to be a criminal, uh, but there is no criminal gene that makes you a criminal. Um, but the eugenics movement essentially said, um, you know, this is all biologically determined, and so, you know, if we can, you know, identify these people that have these traits, well, then we can just, you know, get rid of them. And so, you look here, between 1911 and 1930, uh, we actually had over 30 states in our country uh, that had laws requiring sterilization uh, for behavioral traits that were criminal uh, that were thought to be determined genetically. So, you know, again, most of these kinds of things have been done away with now, uh, but you can see here the danger of, you know, making policies on this kind of stuff when you don't really have uh, a really good scientific basis for what you're doing. Now, there was some research that went into this, but you know, really the research back then was not very sophisticated, 
and uh, you know a lot of the ideas that were spawned were you know turned out to not really hold up to scrutiny over time. Yeah, you know, another part of this eugenics movement uh, were laws that required uh, like you know brain surgeries that would alter people's behavior. Um, you know, all kinds of things, you know, you know, psychosurgery, sterilization, um, you know, and it's argued that the real reason for sterilization wasn't just this idea of feeble-mindedness or criminal behavior, but it really was mostly associated with class, uh, because, you know, criminal populations tend to be, uh, you know, from the lower socioeconomic uh, areas of our society, uh, and so what this really ended up doing was discriminating on peop uh, people on the basis of class uh, almost more so than anything else. So the positivist school though did help usher in an approach to criminal justice policy that was reformative rather than just punitive. Um, you know, we can punish people all day long um, but if we don't help those people to make some changes and uh, you know, reintegrate into society, society successfully, we're going to have a problem. And you know, the classical school was really focused on the punitive side of things. Uh, the positivist school is where we started to get this um, you know, reformative uh, type of idea. So because a lot of these biological ideas from the early you know, researchers uh, it kind of became discredited and didn't hold up all that well. A lot of those theories, you know, kind of started to go away, and the policies based on them went away, and we started looking for new ideas. So as we move more into the positive school, and you could argue that you know, most of the theories and research we work with today uh, would probably be more closely linked to the positive school and scientific ideas uh, more so than the classical school. But reformers uh, that were called progressives argued that the criminal justice system should be arranged to rehabilitate offenders and not just to punish them. So this was an idea that became very popular, uh, and there again, you know, what our policies that that came out, uh, into being because of this, you know, kind of change in philosophy about why we're punishing people. So you know, our country at one point moved from just a retributive, punitive philosophy of punishment uh, to more of a rehabilitative philosophy of punishment. And so what you saw were uh, more indeterminate sentencing policies. Uh, you saw the creation of parole boards that would you know, evaluate whether or not someone should be let out or kept in. Uh, probation was uh, implemented widely under this uh, you know, philosophy uh, because it was seen as a way to, uh, to help people integrate into society better and to help reform them. We started developing treatment programs for individual offenders, and you, know, you still see that today. And uh, during the early 1800s is also uh, when we saw the establishment of a juvenile court system, so that children were treated differently from adults. And the juvenile system is almost entirely uh, rehabilitative in its approach to dealing with juvenile offenders. So just like with anything else, you know, there is debate as to whether this move to a, re to a rehabilitative system made the system more or less humane, uh, because certainly there are some things that probably improved, but as I mentioned earlier, there are also potentials for things to get worse when you adopt this rehabilitative uh, philosophy. Um, you know, one of the things we're starting to look at now is, uh, you know, in, in the field of criminology, biological research is starting to make a resurgence, you know, over the last, you know, 10 years or so. Uh, the technology that we have now with DNA storing and being able to map, you know, the, the genes that people have and identify, you know, what they are and what they're controlling, um, 
it has really spawned a lot more research now in the biological era, and people have been very hesitant to accept it as legitimate because of some of the problems with a lot of the early biological research. Uh, but you know, it is an area that's becoming bigger and more popular, and the technology that we have now is allowing us to do a lot more, I think, than what the early positivists could have ever imagined. So just to wrap it up, keep in mind that uh, criminology, when we start to talk about you know, why people do what they do, uh, what's legal, what's illegal, and why, uh, this is not a value-free exercise. Uh, you know, people's individual values and biases are always going to come into play. But it's important to try and be as objective as you possibly can uh, when you're pursuing any uh, scientific question. And this is important in studying the causes of crime uh, because we all kind of have maybe our own ideas about why people do certain things or what you know, would work or what wouldn't work when it comes to punishment. Um, but really, we need to rely on good, methodologically sound research and not just uh, use our own biases to, to form our ideas. Um, and so one of our tasks uh, as you move forward in the field of criminology is to you know, identify these biases in yourself and in other people uh, you know, so that you can point it out and uh, you know, to try and eradicate that from the field. And I, I think for the most part, uh, you know, the, the big name researchers in the field of criminology do a pretty good job of you know, being pretty objective in their research. Um, but, you know, again, sometimes people uh, just find, maybe find a result that does not line up with their personal mode of thinking, and they may find a way to discount it. Uh, but, you know, you can't just do that. You can't just dismiss something out of hand uh, simply because you don't agree with it. Um, so it's important to identify these biases. So that's it for Chapter 2. Uh, if you have any questions, get in touch with me, and I'll talk to you soon.